Please, don't let me die. In November of 2010, I boarded my flight, returning back to London. Shortly after the cabin doors closed, I felt an intense pressure in my chest. As the, protect, as the pressure continued to build, it turned into pain, which went through my shoulder and down my left arm. My left arm went completely cold. My friend sat next to me, rushed to the stewardess, asking for help. The stewardess hopped on the intercom, asked if there was a doctor on board. Luckily for me, there was one. The doctor rushed over, took my vital signs, and said, we need to emergency land the plane. I think he's having a heart attack. The plane emergency landed in a small town in France on a runway that the airport had shut down. And an emergency response team busted into the plane, took me off into the waiting ambulance, where they administered nitrates to open up my arteries. And as the ambulance sped off to the local hospital, I looked up into the eyes of the French paramedic staring down at me and said, please, don't let me die. I have a five-year-old son. And then my next thought was, I hope you speak English. <laughs> you see, in a moment like that, when you think it's lights out, when you think it's game over, the truth reveals itself. What really matters, it comes out. And it's always about the same thing. It's always about those that are closest to us. I mean, let, it, let me put it this way. If you were suddenly given five more minutes of life on your deathbed, or if you thought you were on your deathbed, you wouldn't be like, oh, Thank God. Would you mind passing me my laptop really quick so I can fire off a few more emails? You see, prior to this point on that plane, I had been absolutely obsessed with achievement for 10 years, but I approached it in all the wrong ways. I pushed myself way too hard. I worked 100-plus-hour work weeks at McKinsey & Company, helping grow Skype before we sold to eBay for $4 billion, and while building several of my own businesses, including Chilango, a chain of Mexican restaurants throughout the UK. But after that point, I realized there had to be a better way. And so my search began, how do I continue performing at a high level without breaking down? And so I went all in and became an expert in the field of high performance. I completed a coaching certification and apprenticeship with Professor B.J. Fogg. He runs Stanford University's Behavior Design Lab. I read hundreds of books and study after study, course after course, just immersing myself in neuroscience, positive psychology, habit change, leadership. All in this quest to become my best. And one of the startling discoveries that I made along the way was that if you look at the top performers, whether they're in military, sports, or business, you will find a coach, someone who stands behind their success. In fact, you may not know this, but the Google founders and Steve Jobs they even shared the, the same coach. And then I thought to myself, well, if even the very best need a coach to both get to the top and to stay there, then what does that say about the rest of us? And so I hired a coach myself. I got into the best health that I've ever been in. I became a lot more present and available as a husband and a father, and I began coaching my leadership team and employees. And then I was recognized as the UK CEO of the year. And I became so inspired with all the positive changes that I thought, I should become a coach myself. Now, I appreciate a lot of you won't have had the health scare that I did. But I also know that nearly all of you will have at some point thought that something needs to change. And I'm sure many of you, like me, have looked in the mirror at times and thought, I thought I'd be a little bit further ahead than I am right now. And I just don't want you to wait too long to decide, because it is a decision to decide to become all that you can be. Because before that plane incident, I didn't feel very balanced. I felt constantly overworked. And while I'd have bouts of success, I'd often easily get derailed. But after that plane incident, and after implementing many of the things that I'm going to be talking to you about today, I started to show up as my best, not just on the work front, but also the health and the home fronts. I started to work more productively, with less effort, and with zero burnout. And I developed a mental toughness to handle just about anything thrown my way. You see, I believe that we can all become extraordinary, that we can all realize our full potential, and that it's never too late to start. 
And over the last 10 years, I've helped hundreds of entrepreneurs and leaders just like you scale up themselves and their companies without sacrificing their health and relationships. I mean, look, we, we all want to get better, right? We all want to become all that we can be. It's in each and every one of us. But that's not the issue. The issue is how. So today I want to share with you three hows. We're going to talk about how can you step into being your best through the use of identity, identity-based change. We're going to talk about how can you become more productive, how can you optimize yourself for action. And we're going to talk about how can you become anti-fragile so that you can better handle the unexpected. So identity, productivity, and anti-fragility, IPA, although we're not going to be talking about beer. <laughs> so let's begin. So identity. Identity is the first thing that I'd like to talk about. And um, the reason we're talking about identity is because we can't create a better future by continuing to be the person that we've been in the past. Now, lots of other people are going to tell you that you need to focus on a myriad of things over a long period of time to change. I'm saying that you just need to focus on three things and that actually you can start to change from the moment you leave this presentation. Now, without doubt, when I work with my clients and, and dig deep, I find that they don't just want to excel on the work front, they also want to excel on the health and the home front. They don't just want to be inspiring entrepreneurs, high-performing leaders. They also want to be fit and healthy. They want to be great spouses and parents. And it's no surprise, because taking a holistic view to high performance, it's absolutely necessary. Take sports, for example. If we, if, we, if we want to achieve high performance, you can't just look at what's going on on the field. You have to look at what's going on off the field as well. But here's the secret. We get to choose our identities. We can choose who we want to be. We don't need to wait three, five, ten years to improve. We just need to define what best looks like for us, for you, and then step into that and own it. In my coming book, The Three Alarms, I share three simple phone alarms that I've used to segment my day. Each segment is powered by a best self-identity that means something to me, something I can both shoot for and measure myself against. Sometimes that self-measurement happens in the moment and I course correct. Sometimes it happens even before and brings a bit more intentionality into whatever that situation is. Sometimes that self-measurement happens afterwards, and it prompts me to reflect. The first alarm that goes off on my phone every day is set for 6.30 a.m., and it says World Fitness Champion. I am not a World Fitness Champion, and I never will be. But that's not the point. That's the version of me that wakes up in the morning with the desire to go to the gym. That's the version of me that shows up and does the workout routine. And when I'm in the gym sometimes and I'm on a particular exercise and I might get to that eighth rep and I feel like, ah, I'm just not feeling it today, that identity kicks off in my head. And suddenly the ninth and the tenth and the eleventh and twelfth repetitions are completed for good measure. At 9 a.m., my next alarm goes off. It says, world's best coach, because that's who's showing up for the workday. It prompts me to reflect, what's that version of me look like? How inspiring, insightful, and reliable is that person? How supportive are they? And how bold are they? How willing are they to step into discomfort and ask my clients the questions nobody else dares to in the spirit of serving them? And the most important alarm of all for me goes off at 6.30 p.m. And it says, world's best husband and father. To prompt the question, how would the world's best husband and father walk through that door right now? I thought I had gotten everything right after that plane incident. Handful of years later, my wife told me she was leaving me. If I didn't change my ways. She said I was around, but that I didn't really truly see her. I wasn't really present and available. 
You see, I'd get home after a long day of work, and she might want to talk about something or ask for some help, and I'd always want to put it off. The kids would want to play, and it wasn't exactly the right time. Is that how the world's best husband responds? Is that how the world's best father responds? Of course not. And by continually reminding myself of what best looks like, I didn't become perfect, far from that, but I definitely progressed. And today I'm a lot better as a husband and father than I ever was. And the home is particularly important for me because I say if you want to become a great leader, start by becoming a great spouse and parent because leadership starts at home. And by continually reminding yourself of what best looks like across, across the home, health, and work front, you'll be able to more frequently close that gap between who you are and who you're capable of being so your best version of you more consistently shows up. Now, I'd like to tell you a story about Patrick. So Patrick is the CEO of a 100 million pound manufacturing company. Uh, he uh, did one of my uh, free high performance insight sessions and subscribed to the newsletter. And if you're, uh, by the way, if you want to receive everything that I'm talking about today and have access to all the latest high performance insights, just head over to my website. It's at the bottom of the page there, ericpartaker.com, and you can sign up. Now, Patrick wrote in, and he said, Eric, I've implemented my own alarms, and the changes have been massive in a short period of time. And he went on to tell me what each of these alarms were for him. At 6.30 a.m., he created an alarm. It was also his wake-up call that said, 70-year-old me. Because Patrick thought, if the 70-year-old version of me greeted me every day to show me the effect of the poor health decisions that I'm making day in and day out, then I might not make those decisions. And guess what? Patrick was right. It worked for him. He suddenly started going, going to the gym four days a week when he hadn't been once in two years. That apple and cinnamon muffin and the coffee that he was getting on his way to work every day, that was gone. And then as he went throughout his day, all that bread that he was eating, see you later, processed foods, gone. Patrick told me that in three months he lost 12 kilos, nearly 25 or over 25 pounds. At 8.45 a.m., Patrick said he set an alarm that says, world's best leader. Because that's the time that he would be sat down at his desk and he wanted to think with intentionality, how will the world's best leader show up today? What does that version of me do? Now, I had also trained up Patrick in the art of difficult conversations because they happen far too infrequently when we're building businesses. And so Patrick decided to combine this best self-identity, this world's best leader, with this art of difficult conversation training in a desire to improve the safety within his company. Remember, he's running a manufacturing company here, so safety is paramount. So Patrick held a safety summit with his leaders, explained why safety was important, where they wanted to get to, and then also laid out the consequences of them not achieving what they needed to achieve, which included dismissal. And within just three weeks, Patrick said that the safety, the accidents in the company dropped by 75%. And then Patrick shared that his last alarm he set for 6.30 p.m. It was the same as mine, world's best husband and father. It just needs to mean something for you. It doesn't need to necessarily be unique or different. It needs to motivate you. And he admitted that was still a work in progress. He said sometimes that that alarm would go off and he'd still be at work. And then he'd ask himself, Why, what am I doing here? and he'd pack up and head home more quickly. Other times he'd be on his way home and the alarm would go off. And Patrick said that this was incredibly helpful because his wife was running the household of four kids and that he didn't fully appreciate how difficult that was. But when he thought about this on the way home, he was a lot more receptive to helping out and he started to actually work with his wife to coach in the children the behaviors that they both wanted to see. You see, what I'm trying to get across to you here is that most people aspire to be their best sometime in the future. Forget all that. You can be your best right now. Just define what the identity is, step into it and own it, and find a way to remind yourself of it continually. So concretely, what can you do following this segment here? Well, as I said, you can leave today already stepping into being your best. Define what are the phrases or the the people, if that's your identity, that 
define you at your best that means something to you in the health work and home fronts or relationship fronts. And then set those at the appropriate time of day. Set your own alarms. So the next thing I want to talk to you about is productivity. And the reason that we're talking about productivity today is simply because we can't reach our full potential unless we master the art of getting the right things done with the least amount of effort. That is true productivity. I'm sure you've felt, as I have, along the way that there's times when you just thought that you lack the, the willpower, focus, and the discipline to get what needs to be done. Or that you didn't have enough hours in the day. Or that your day felt constantly full of busy work and not enough deep work on what matters most. Now, I can't teach you all the things about productivity because there's a million different ways that we can cut it. But I'm going to teach you the highest leverage things that I've learned and have successfully implemented with great result in both myself and my clients. And the first thing I want to take you through today is, is powerful routines. This is another subject. You, you can inundate yourself with routines and, and, and different things that you can be doing. I just want you to focus on a, on a few. First of all, recognize that productivity, a productive day, doesn't start the morning of. It starts the day before. And it starts with eight hours of sleep. If you have less than eight hours of sleep, you will not be nearly productive as you could be. You'll be prone to procrastination and you'll fade. And now, if you think that you can survive with less than eight hours of sleep, you're right. So can I. Everyone in this room can survive for a long period of time without eight hours of sleep. Maybe it's seven and a half, seven, six and a half, six. We all can. But you're making the wrong statement about sleep. It's not about surviving. It's about a thriving. Would you thrive more if you had the full eight hours? And if you think that you're not someone who needs eight hours to thrive fully, then let me just ask a simple question. Has anyone in this room been struck by lightning? No, I didn't think so. Because your odds of having the gene that allow you to thrive with less than eight hours of sleep is equivalent to being struck by lightning. So you don't have the gene. <laughs> All that's happened is, is that you've become accustomed to operating at a lower baseline. So the routine here is called a digital sunset. And you set this for one hour before your bedtime. And when it's digital sunset, all the electronics go off. And the reason all the electronics need to go off is because our bodies have not evolved for the blue light that's constantly going from these electronic devices into our eyes at all times of day. It doesn't match in what happens out in nature. And what ends up happening in the body is that the body feels that it's still daylight. And so it doesn't produce melatonin in the brain. In fact, if you're looking at any electronic blue light emitting devices in the one hour before sleep, your melatonin production in your brain will be 50% less than what it should be. That means that, of course, you'll struggle to sleep eight hours because you don't have enough of that going on and you won't sleep as restoratively as you could. The next routine, when you wake up in the morning, do not go straight into your inbox, social media, or the news. This is the equivalent of taking yourself and dropping yourself into a pinball machine so that you can be bounced around from one person's agenda to the next. The simple mantra to live by here is always be creative before reactive. For at least the first 60 minutes of each day, see what happens to your productivity if you do not do reactive work. Instead, you work on that report, presentation, or that thinking time or strategic thought process that you have not been getting to. And then... Last but not least, as you work throughout your day, single task. Don't subscribe to the multitasking myth. The average worker loses 28% of their day due to the inefficiencies of constantly task switching, which is what multitasking really is. And that's because they have to reorient to them, themselves back to what they were working on and, and pick up where they left off and try to find their place again, rather than just sticking with one task at a time. Now, 28%, you might just kind of you know, pass through that number and think, ah, oh, on a daily basis, it's not much. But it is a lot, because if you add that up and you apply 28% to the number of total work weeks in a year, you get 13 weeks a year lost. 
13 weeks a year just so happens to be an entire quarter. This means that the average person who thinks that they don't have time for everything is only playing with three quarters a year. Imagine what would happen to your productivity if you had a full four quarters. Next thing I want to talk about is massive goals. So when I was growing up, my parents always told me, Eric, shoot for the moon, because even if you miss, you'll still land amongst the stars. We can optimize ourselves for productivity by installing the right routines, but we still need to have something that we can be productive towards, such that productivity becomes more a force that pulls us into action rather than a whip that feels like it's maybe pushing us or driving us into action. Now, when I was at Skype, our tagline was, the whole world can talk for free. And as you can imagine, this created an absolutely incredible revolutionary spirit inside the company. We thought we were doing the world good. And that massive goal definitely inspired massive action, which led to massive results, because we sold to eBay for $4 billion. The reason massive goals are such an incredible productivity driver in both your business and life is due to a handful of things. Number one, it forces you to commit before you're ready. This is one of the biggest productivity killers when people think that they're, oh, I'm just not ready yet. You'll never be ready with so many things. And by picking a massive goal, you're guaranteed to not be ready. And so what I like about that is that it forces you to get used to the idea of committing and taking action before everything's in place. Number two, Setting a massive goal gets you to dream big again. We lose our ability to dream somewhere along the way. We're so good at it as kids, and then we sort of forget, and we feel embarrassed if we dream big. The heck with that. Start dreaming big again. Because when you dream big, you find something that excites you, and you'll be a lot more productive when you're working on something that you find to be exciting. Number three, by focusing on a massive goal, it's going to make you hyper-aware of your time. There's so much to do. You have to account for every second, so you'll naturally be more productive. Number four. and confront your deficiencies, and confront where are you getting in your own way. This was particularly important for me, because as I crossed that chasm from founder to CEO, I saw I was getting in my own way. And I noticed a lot of leadership gaps, and I voiced these gaps with my coach. And so we set a massive goal. My, my coach said, well, why don't you go for the CEO of the Year Award? And I laughed at first, but then I said, okay, I got two years, so let's start planning against that. What was the container for how I would do this work? That first hour of every day, always be creative before reactive. I started to use that as my personal development container. And I used that time to interview other top performing CEOs to understand what drove their success. I read book after book on leadership and peak performance, and I did 360s with my board and team, all in that quest to improve my leadership so that I can improve the way I led and the results that we were experiencing. And it culminated in that CEO of the year recognition. And it didn't just create that short-term benefit, but it also created a longer-term benefit in that it put me in a better position as I am today to be able to help other leaders take their leadership up to the next level. I'll give you a, a, another example. So um, John, he um, also did a, a, a free high-performance insight session. Then he ended up becoming a client. John is the CEO of a digital transformation agency, and he really wanted to close the gap between five and 10 million a year in annual sales, but he felt that the performance of his team was holding him back. I had John look in the mirror, first of all, because it wasn't just that the performance of his team was holding him back, it was that the leadership wasn't getting the team performing at a high enough level. And we sat down and we made changes to his strategy, execution, and people to help him generate better results through the team. And soon they're off and running, closing that gap between five and 10 million a year in sales. The last thing about productivity I want to talk, to, talk about is 80-20 focus. So the worst thing you can do in the world is be super efficient at doing things that shouldn't be done at all. Um, so 
Um, when I was at McKinsey and Company, one of the things drilled into my head was always look for the 20% of things that drives 80% of the results. And I'll give you an example of how I apply this to the Mexican restaurant chain that we built, Chilango. So there's lots of things that we can be offering in a quick service restaurant environment, from the food to the interiors to the people. So where do you focus? You can't do everything at the level that you would like to do. So we zeroed in on the food. We thought 20% drive the 80% of results, it, it's, it's in the food. But then most people stop there. But we said, well, what about the food? What's the 20% in the food that will drive 80% of our guest satisfaction? We said it's about the flavor at the end of the day. But then we didn't stop there, another 80, 20 level deep. So we looked at over the, the 20 different menu components that build our meals. And we said, well, what 20% of them drive 80% of the flavor? and we zeroed in on those specific menu components. But we didn't stop there. We did another 80-20 level deep, and we looked at the recipes of those meal components. And we said, what are the 20% of the ingredients within these recipes that will drive 80% of the flavor? Suddenly, we're shaking hands with farmers in the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico to get our dried chilies directly at the quality that we need, because that was one of the key ingredients. So my question to you is, where can 80-20 thinking improve your productivity? 20% of your actions in life to date will probably account for 80% of where you are today. What 20% of your customer offering will drive 80% of customer satisfaction? What is your 20%? What is the 20% in your business in life that will create 80% of your results? And if you have a great coach, they'll help you zero in on that 20% so you can focus on stuff that actually moves the needle rather than focusing on everything. So to wrap up productivity, concrete steps that you can take, I want to remind you three areas. One, get your routines in order. Don't focus on all the routines out there in the world. Just focus on three. Digital sunsets that you're getting your eight hours of sleep. That first hour of the day, be creative before reactive. And master the art of single tasking so that you can reclaim one quarter per year in your life. After 10 years, it's, you know, it's two and a half years. Number two, massive goals. How can you turn productivity into something that pulls you rather than something that feels like a whip and that's pushing you? And then lastly, 80-20 focus. How can you apply 80-20 thinking in your life to focus on what matters most? The last thing I'm going to talk to you about today is anti-fragility. The reason we're talking about anti-fragility is because it's the ultimate upgrade to strength and resilience. The resilient can absorb shock and stays the same. The anti-fragile takes on stress and shock and actually becomes stronger. You see, most people think that stress is something that's negative. You think that stress is something that should be avoided, but you're thinking about it wrong. Stress is actually something that you should embrace and something that you should move into. Some of my clients, as, as Ollie mentioned, include uh, uh, former U.S. Special Forces operatives, and these guys are absolute anti-fragility machines. They step into discomfort, they embrace it. Wherever they, they feel stress or unease, they know that that's the direction in which they should be moving. And you may not think that you have a lot in common with people like that, but then you'd be wrong. Because your bodies, my body, all of our bodies are the perfect model for anti-fragility. Small doses of UV radiation actually repair tissues and generates vitamin D in your body, which is need for, needed for every cell in your body. Exposure to germs and bacteria is actually what builds our immune system. And stressing a muscle causes it to grow. So you see, all we need to do is actually get the anti-fragility that you're already doing here in your bodies up here in your head. Mental anti-fragility. So how do we do that? Well, I'll give you a few tricks. So one is, if you take three groups of people, and the first group lives a stress-free life. The second group has stress in their life, but they view it positively. And the third group has stress in their life and views it negatively. Which group do you think lives the longest? Exactly. It's the second group that has stress in their life, but views it 
positively. So then we could take that idea a little bit further and we can think of life as one big mental gym whereby every moment of adversity, every unexpected event, everything or change that doesn't go our way as we would like, it becomes an opportunity to do a bit of exercise. It's a repetition in the gym of life where we can start to alchemize those challenges into growth. Marcus Aurelius, one of the great Roman emperors, in his personal journal he wrote, well, I guess it's not so personal if I'm talking about it, but he wrote, <laughs> he wrote, uh, I must expect to be knocked down repeatedly in life, physically and mentally, but I must seek to regain my harmony, my equanimity, as he said it, as quickly as possible. That was the game. My favorite Japanese proverb is, fall down seven times, stand up eight. All of these things are kind of pointing in roughly the same direction, right? Embrace stress. View it positively and ask yourself, how can I grow from this? Maybe Nietzsche was right. Create space. This is a tool to give you a little continuity on the previous point to help you actually do this. Now, most people don't realize that there actually is a space between stimulus and response. And that's because when something triggers us, i.e. a stimulus, our response is typically fused directly to it as if there's no space at all. And when something happens, often that response will be an emotional reaction or something suboptimal, i.e. not what the best version of us, not how that version of us might respond. Whether this is the team not performing as well as we would like, the company not hitting its results, perhaps it's uh, somebody cutting us off or we miss our train, and we might blurt out that emotional reaction because we don't take time to create space. And taking time to create space, it's just a moment of pause that you're looking for. It could be a deep breath. It could be asking yourself to pause. It could be walking away from the situation. But what you're trying to do is create a little bit of tiny bit of awareness so that we shut off the ancient part of our brain that's just reacting emotionally, the monkey brain. And we're giving a chance to turn on this part of our brain, the prefrontal cortex. This is what makes us human. So that we can choose what the optimal response is. And the more we do that, the more we create space so that we can choose the optimal response. And the more we ingrain that pattern in, the neural pathways in our brain change. They do. And that new optimal way of behaving and responding becomes the new norm. The last thing that you can do to make yourself more anti-fragile is hire a coach. If you study the field of mastery, as I have, you'll see that one of the commonalities between all those who have reached the very top is they had a coach, whether it's business, sports, military. And that's because everything that we've talked about so far is about you really upping your game on your inner wisdom, but there's going to be things that come your way that you just can't handle on your own. Maybe subjects that you just don't feel comfortable discussing with your team, board members, investors, maybe even family members. But having a coach there can help you think through it and also hold you accountable. So key criteria that you should look for when evaluating a coach. Choose someone that's going to advise you from the trenches, not the ivory tower. Choose someone who's actually built a business and held a leadership position. Choose someone that you can get along with emotionally and rationally. And choose someone that you think will not just support and cradle you, that is part of it, but who also serve you by once again asking you the questions, calling you out on where you're getting in your own way in the spirit of helping you progress more quickly. Whatever your progress is on your own, you will progress more quickly with the help of a coach. Now, one of the questions that I most commonly get is, Eric, can you coach and mentor me? And the answer is yes. I help entrepreneurs and leaders just like you scale up themselves and their companies while also improving their well-being. And as my contribution to this event, I'm offering 10 free high-performance insight sessions where you'll walk away with your top three things that will help you take your business and life to the next level. This is an hour-long session that will impact your life 
for decades. And that's whether you're an entrepreneur that's just raised a bunch of money, maybe you have an established business between one and 10 million in sales, maybe you're at 10 to 100 million and beyond in sales. Wherever you are, this session will definitely help you turn things up a notch. And just don't do what I did. Don't wait too long. Don't take things to the edge to start closing that gap between who you are and who you're capable of being. I want you to picture a day when you've scaled up your leadership, your company, and your well-being. I want you to picture a day when you're more confident as a leader, when you feel vibrant and healthy with more time for your family. I want you to picture a day when you've become the best version of you. And I'll leave you with this. Now, following that plane incident, I continued to experience symptoms, including very high blood pressure for years. But then, suddenly the symptoms went away. And my cardiologist said that if I were to refer you, Eric, to another doctor and not share your history, they wouldn't be able to find any evidence of prior trauma to your heart. And I'm 100% certain this is because of having correctly implemented the myriad of high-performance insights that I've gathered wrongly and rightly over the last 20 years. You see, every mistake you've made to date doesn't matter. The time that you've wasted doesn't matter. Who you were yesterday doesn't matter. You can reach your full potential. You can reach your full potential as an entrepreneur and leader. You can reach your full potential with your company and people. You can reach your full potential with your health and relationships. You can reach your full potential. And I'd be honored to help you. Thank you.